Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. When we left off last time, most of Europe was at peace. But the entire continent, nearly every nation, was on the cusp of war. It was a conflict that would shape Europe for centuries to come, literally. This war would shake the old pillars of religion, of social order, of empire, of their class structure, and the very idea of monarchy itself. It was a war that would impact everybody in Europe, from the halls of power to the lowliest commoner. Really, as Europe was poised to embark on the greatest era of imperialism in history, this was a war that would impact everybody in the world, if indirectly. This is episode number 25, Pit Stop on the Continent, Part 2. We left off with the defeat of the Protestant-led Bohemian Revolt by a coalition of Catholic forces from all around Europe. This coalition, with the enthusiastic backing of the Pope, was called the German Catholic League. The League included most of the Catholic lords of the Holy Roman Empire under Emperor Ferdinand II, who was allied with Philip III of Spain. Not only allied, but closely related, both Philip III and Ferdinand II were members of the House of Habsburg. Now, the Bohemian Revolt and the Greater War in general were about religion, that's true, The battle lines are drawn up almost perfectly along the lines of religious division, but not quite perfectly. This war was, as are all wars, honestly, really about power. The Habsburgs were too mighty for the comfort of the other monarchs of Europe, especially the newly founded Bourbon dynasty there in France. France is the outlier in this conflict. They're the piece of the puzzle that shows that this war was not just about Catholicism versus Protestantism. See, France was ruled by a Catholic monarchy, and they were willing to go to war to protect that, as we'll soon see, but they would ally with the forces of Protestantism against the incursion and expansion of Habsburg dominion. But before France could enter into the greater European war that was taking shape, they had a little bit of housekeeping to take care of. The founding member of the Bourbon dynasty was King Henry IV. He was that Huguenot leader that converted to Catholicism to cement his rule after taking the throne. Before he was assassinated, he signed the Edict of Nantes, a document that guaranteed religious freedom for all French Calvinists. Unfortunately, his son, Louis XIII, had no such sympathies toward the Protestant cause, nor did his mother, Marie de' Medici, or his chief counselor, Cardinal Richelieu. This trifecta chipped away at Protestant rites all across France, and finally they wound up sending troops into Protestant areas to implement Catholic control. The Protestants, who were none too happy about this, convened a council at the city of La Rochelle in December 1620. There they declared their intent to establish an independent state within a state, a Protestant republic, very much in the mold of the Dutch Republic. King Louis, his mother and Cardinal Richelieu, had to take measures to nip this in the bud, and the French army did not mess around. Entire populations of Huguenot strongholds were executed. Cities were burned to the ground. Women and children were massacred. So, The Huguenot forces elected to sign a peace treaty, but Cardinal Richelieu and King Louis failed to meet their agreements in the treaty, and once again, the Protestants rose up. They focused on their naval capabilities, as La Rochelle was certain to be blockaded by the Royal Navy. The leader of the Huguenot forces in France at this time, Benjamin de Rohan, gave himself the title Admiral of the Protestant Church, and he led several pretty successful attacks against the French Navy. I mention this period and these naval attacks in particular because this was the campaign in which hundreds, perhaps even thousands, of young French Protestant sailors were earning their chops. They were learning the ins and outs of life at sea and the reality of naval warfare. They were learning, in short, what it was like to be an oppressed minority surrounded by a powerful Catholic empire and how to use their capabilities at sea to defend and enrich themselves. These young men, at least some of them, would go on to leave Europe behind and emigrate to the New World. 
Many of them would congregate on the coast of Hispaniola and the nearby island of Tortuga, though that would come after their defeat. And defeated they were. In 1625, the Huguenot fleet was thoroughly routed. Another peace treaty was signed, but then, for some reason, England decided to get involved. This was when King Charles sent that fleet carrying some 6,000 soldiers to France to aid his Protestant allies. Now, this wasn't the first naval misadventure of the Stuart dynasty, and it wouldn't be the last, but this was truly a spectacular failure. The English were sent packing in short order with their tail between their legs, and King Charles' rule in England was further weakened. Unfortunately, the French forces didn't have the strength to fight King Louis. They'd only done so with the promise of aid from King Charles, and now that his help was gone, they had no defense against the king and Cardinal Richelieu. The siege of La Rochelle lasted for 14 months, and it saw more than 22,000 civilians die. The aftermath, too, was truly devastating. All across France, Huguenot nobles were exiled or executed. Once again, entire populations of Huguenot cities were decimated or entirely executed. All of the rights of Protestantism in France at the time were extinguished. The Huguenots were really no longer a political power to be reckoned with. That's why so many of these men fled France in favor of her overseas possessions, why so many of them turned away from a life of citizenship and toward a life of lawless freedom, a life of anarchy, really. This was why these men preferred to cut logwood, hunt boar to be cooked on their boucans, and harass any Catholics that got in the way of them living their lives. After the siege of La Rochelle, though, the Bourbon dynasty was in firm control of their nation. They would, in time, become the most powerful kings in Europe, with an absolute monarchy that saw very little religious or structural reform, until Louis XVI signed the Edict of Versailles more than 150 years later in a futile attempt to salvage his crown and his head. For the time being, though, France was ready to involve themselves in what was shaping up to be the largest and most devastating war that Europe had ever seen. France feared the proximity of Habsburg forces on their border in the Spanish Netherlands. While they were still busy mopping up the Huguenot forces, though, they were too busy to actually commit troops to battle, but they did begin to send financial aid to their allies. They offered this aid primarily, at first, to the Danish king Christian IV, as Denmark was the primary front of the war at the time. The Danish were concerned about Catholic suzerainty on their border and their king's holding and the empire itself. King Christian was outmanned and outgunned by the forces of Ferdinand II, though he was being subsidized by the French. So he called on the Protestant nations in Europe to send him men. Sweden promised to send him men as soon as they were done fighting in other parts of Europe. The Protestant German princes there in the Holy Roman Empire naturally sent as many men as they could. They were already neck deep in Catholic armies, after all. The call was also answered by King Charles of England and Scotland. Remember, they were still different nations at the time. The Scottish sent some 14,000 men and the English 6,000. The English were commanded by one Sir Charles Morgan, who was a Welsh-born knight from the county of Monmouthshire, the same county and the same family that would produce Henry Morgan some five years later. Sir Charles Morgan was specifically well-suited to command forces on the continent as he had begun his career in the English expeditionary force that was involved in the Eighty Years' War between Spain and the Netherlands. Beyond that, Charles II had married a Dutch woman, the daughter, in fact, of William the Silence, aide-de-camp. This is one of those connections. I suppose it shouldn't be too surprising. The Protestants in northern Europe were essentially besieged by their Catholic neighbors, and they had a relatively small pool of other Protestants to marry and ally with. So maybe I'm reaching here. Maybe this is a just kind of a dark helmet situation. You remember that, that I am your father's brother's nephew's former roommate. What's that make us? Absolutely nothing. But 
I'm just constantly surprised by the sheer number of connections here. It shows me that Captain Morgan was fighting the same fight that his not-too-distant relatives had been fighting for decades. It's also funny the strange bedfellows that this war created. The English and the French were both allied with Denmark, though at the time they were currently in a war with each other. But the threat of the Catholic League and the Habsburg Empire was too great to ignore. Now, none of the aid offered by Christian IV's allies arrived in time to help him. France was still dealing with the end of their civil war, and England was dealing with the beginning of theirs. Denmark was dealt a series of defeats that saw imperial forces freely marching through the nation, so they concluded a peace. It was a surprisingly favorable peace, as far as Denmark saw it, though, with Ferdinand II. The imperial generals were well aware of the threat of these other nations entering into this fight, especially the nation of Sweden. They needed to get Denmark out of the war as soon as possible, so King Christian IV lost none of his Danish territory as long as he agreed to pull out of the war. Unfortunately for the Protestant German princes who had allied with him, this meant that they had, for the time being, no real allies to speak of. The House of Habsburg rode over them with ease. When they could, they made peace, but that could be almost as bad as fighting. Soldiers who violently hated the people they were conquering saw their eradication as their holy religious duty, and they committed acts of true terror. This was a dark time for Germany. Soldiers coming to molest, mutilate, and murder you might not be the only threat. Crops all over Europe were failing, disease was spreading, people were starving and dying in the thousands. I can only imagine what they must have been feeling at the time, what they must have thought. They must have wondered if God had abandoned them, or perhaps they'd been wrong the whole time. Perhaps they were the heretics after all. They blamed, as so often happens in these times, the others, the outcasts in their society. Neighbors looked at other neighbors with cold suspicion. They turned to massacres and lynchings, mass hangings, and witch hunts. Several prince archbishops were organizing mass trials wherein any undesirables were rounded up and accused of the crime of witchcraft. Some of them even went so far as to erect entire buildings to house their courtrooms. These were structures that held some of the most despicable implements of torture ever conceived. They lined the walls with Bible verses, and they questioned their prisoners for hours. The word questioned there is, of course, a polite euphemism for what was actually happening. Most of those questioned were old women or young girls, and the methods that these archbishops used is, well, it's something I'd really rather not talk about. I'd really rather not think about it. When these torture masters, they called themselves confessors, when they were satisfied, the accused were killed, some by drowning, some by the sword, but most were tied to a stake and burned. Most of these in full view of their neighbors who were rejoicing in their fate. Sometimes only one or two at a time, sometimes dozens. This was the height of European witch hunts and the fervor over witchcraft, and honestly it's the source of where most of our image of witch hunting comes from. It's difficult to get a fix on exactly how many people were accused of witchcraft around this time. These confessors didn't always keep the best records, but most estimates go as high as 600 people terribly tortured and massacred, all in the span of only about two years. While all of this was going on, all across the empire, the Catholic League was mopping up the Protestant rebels and subjecting them to some pretty severe persecution. To the west, though, another front was an open warfare. The Bohemian Revolt, that opening move of the war that had been crushed back in 1620, well, that wasn't the end of the fighting there. The Palatinate was the home of Frederick V, the Winter King and the leader of Bohemia that was in exile in the Netherlands. Frederick and his Dutch allies conducted a defense of the Rhine, which was key to their war plans. 
Frederick wanted to defend his home, and the Dutch needed the Rhine secure if they were to survive in their fight against Spain. This was, in effect, the resumption of the conflict between the Spanish and the Dutch, called the Eighty Years' War. Legally, though, the truce between them was still in force. There was even a possibility that Philip III of Spain and the Dutch Republic could come to some sort of accord to end any further war. But then Philip III died, and with him, any hope of peace. His son, Philip IV, was 16 years old. He was eager to prove himself, and he wanted very much to involve Spain in this general European war. Spain's main reason for returning to war, though, was economic. The Dutch had built a great naval empire that was a real threat to Spain. The Dutch East India Company had nearly taken over the spice trade from Asia, and now they were moving in on the New World. Thus, a new front in the war was thrown open. This theater of war would take place at sea. The Spanish harassed all Dutch shipping in the Strait of Gibraltar and the English Channel. They harassed them around the ports of Italy. They harassed them near the Levant, and they harassed them on the shores of Asia. The Dutch turned to what was perhaps an unexpected ally, the pirates of the Mediterranean, hailing out of the ports on the Barbary coast. These are the famous Barbary pirates, Muslim corsairs that had threatened European shipping for centuries. I really haven't even mentioned the Muslim intervention in the Thirty Years' War, but it was substantial. During the earlier Bohemian Revolt, the Ottoman Empire allied with the Protestants and sent thousands of soldiers in to aid them. The Ottomans had a long history, of course, of siding with Protestants against the Catholics. These Catholics and Muslims had something of a colorful past. Now, though, the pirates of Barbary were openly allied with the Dutch. Now, this era, this topic, the Barbary pirates in general, requires a show of its own, and I plan on doing that show in the not-too-distant future. Suffice it to say, though, that the Dutch helped to modernize the Barbary fleet. They put it on a par with their own. The Dutch had some of the best ships in the world at the time, and they shared with these pirates their designs for ships, their designs for rigging, and their designs for armaments that made the Barbary fleet among the best that existed. For the Netherlanders, for now at least, this was an excellent play. The Barbary corsairs were implacable enemies to the Spanish, and North Africa was far too well defended to invade. A number of Dutch sailors liked the Barbary coast and their people so well, as well as the lifestyle of piracy, that they elected to stay. They set down roots, they converted to Islam, and they married women there. Some of the most notorious Barbary pirates actually were Dutch. Now, this was the resumption of the Eighty Years' War, and it was here that the two wars, the Eighty Years' War and the Thirty Years' War, merged. The Mediterranean, though, was far from the only front in this war between the Netherlands and Spain. Anywhere that Spanish ships carried cargo, the Dutch East India Company was there. And if we're being totally honest, the English pirates followed in their wake. Now, the Dutch and the English weren't working together. These were pirates, after all. The English pirates just chose to not attack Dutch vessels and only attack Spanish vessels. The Dutch just chose to buy all of the ill-gotten goods that these English pirates stole. It was pure coincidence, swearsies. See, the English are frequently, especially in this conflict, called to task for being shy or timid. They were a Protestant nation, and they weren't sending all that many troops to go help their sister nations. There are two points to be made here, though. First, England was on the brink of civil war. Their king and their parliament could agree on almost nothing. They may have been, at best, secondary players, but it was a lack of political will, not courage, that stayed their hand. In his book To Rule the Waves, naval historian Arthur Herman writes, quote, Members of the House of Commons heatedly debated whether England should send an army into Germany to fight the Habsburg menace, or to join hands with the Dutch to shut down the channel to Spanish troop ships and army pay ships. In either case, they asserted there was no need to increase England's defense budget or provide additional supply through taxes. The Crown's obligation was to take up the Protestant cause, not to ask for the funds with which to pay for it. End quote. The second point that needs to be made is that, though English soldiers were occupied, their navy was busy languishing in port. 
England's greatest victories, though, since the time of Elizabeth had not been in charging in and winning the day. They didn't have the strength for that. Their greatest strength was in their ships and in the bold mariners that sailed on them. And England did put these to use. Not, no, not in great naval engagements, but in privateering and in piracy. It was very much the same tactic that was used by Queen Elizabeth that made the English so fearsome. Hurt the enemy, stay out of trouble, and get paid. British troops were not totally out of the greater fight in Germany, though. After the surrender of Denmark, the Catholic League really appeared victorious. There were no forces left in Germany that could rival those of the combined Spanish and German Habsburgs. But that small force of Scottish and English troops that had been sent to aid the King of Denmark, well, they still held out. They defended one town on the northern coast of Europe. For weeks they were under siege. Their ships were still in the harbor there. They were still seaworthy. At any point, these Englishmen could have left and gone home to their families, but they didn't. They stayed. They dug in their heels, and they defended against the Catholic League. They would not retreat. You see, this small city offered the defense of a beachhead on the coast. This landing site was perhaps the most important position left to all of Protestantism in Germany. That's because there was one army left in all of Europe that had the strength and the will to fight the Holy Roman Empire. That was the Swedish, under Gustavus Adolphus. Now you might have noticed that this was a time characterized by less than impressive monarchs. The days of Queen Elizabeth and Philip II were gone. The Stuarts in England were watching their country crumble beneath them. The king of France was a boy, and he was weak. France was actually run by, in truth, Cardinal Richelieu. Their king didn't come remotely close to matching the majesty of his heir, the Sun King. Philip IV of Spain was... Well, he didn't even hold a candle to his grandfather. King Christian of Denmark, though he was ambitious and talented, he failed... In all of his endeavors, the Holy Roman Emperors were, well, madmen. The Dutch Republic had decided to do away with monarchy entirely. Gustavus Adolphus, though, well, his real name was Gustav II Adolf. But after his death, he would be honored in the tradition of Roman emperors with the Latin title Gustavus Adolphus Magnus. To be given that title is an honor only a few in history have received. It means, essentially, the great. We're talking about people like Alexander Magnus, Pompey Magnus, Carl Magnus, better known as Charlemagne. And King Gustav earned that title. He was seen, even during his lifetime, as one of the greatest military commanders alive. When he was raised to the throne, he inherited three wars against Poland, Russia, and Denmark. Now, the war against Denmark was the first he dealt with, and in truth it was inconclusive. The Swedish did, however, repel the Danes from their lands and successfully defend their country. The fact that this war had been his first may have played a role in why he decided not to aid the king of Denmark when he called for it. The war with Russia, though, Gustav won, on Russian soil. That's an impressive feat for any commander. That's something that Napoleon and Hitler both failed to do. Gustav also, in that war with Russia, gained some very valuable territory. He essentially took all of Russia's Baltic ports and cut Russia off from the Baltic Sea for almost a century. This gained Sweden a lot of prestige and, honestly, a lot of power. Now, he won the war with Poland, too, He concluded the war almost immediately after Denmark was defeated. This may be, in part, because the situation just called for it. That was the correct tactical move, but a lot of historians have suggested that he continued the war with Poland long after it was actually won just because he didn't want to pull out and aid Christian IV. He wanted to charge in after they had been defeated and claim all of the glory and honor for himself and for Sweden. He wanted to, as much as possible, upstage his Danish rival. When he landed on the continent, 
Germany was in one of its darkest positions, and Protestant soldiers from all over the empire flocked to him. The disaffected Protestant German princes, what were left of them, joined them with their armies. Mercenaries from all of the Protestant nations in Europe flocked to him, paid for with French gold. The French, well, they didn't yet send troops, but they did send him plenty of gold. They were essentially funding King Gustav's war. And then, then there was the Scottish. While the English Parliament might be busy twiddling their thumbs, the Scottish Presbyterians had no such compunction. They sent thousands of troops to aid their Swedish and German cousins, including no small number of generals and marshals. Immediately, as soon as they landed in 1630, Sweden began capturing coastal towns and cities. The Catholic lords who had been installed were pushed out, and Protestants, usually, who had close ties to King Gustav, were put into power. Gustav's forces began to move south by southwest, taking yet more cities, installing more Germans and more Swedes, even sometimes relatives of King Gustav himself. But then the first major clash between the renewed Protestant forces and the Catholic League took place. It was the Battle of Breitenfeld in 1631. The Catholic forces there were forced to retreat, and Gustav continued his campaign of liberating Protestant Germany. A year later, though, with much of northern Germany firmly back in Protestant hands, another imperial force moved north. Again, the Catholic force was defeated, this time killing their general, one of the top generals in the Catholic cause, and dealing a major blow to Emperor Ferdinand. When this battle was over, it was clear that the war had turned unequivocally in favor of Protestantism at least in the north of Germany. In the south, the House of Habsburg was still firmly in control, and the southwest of Germany had a large number of Protestant people living there that were firmly under the boot of Catholic forces. So the army, after winning these two key battles, marched to go liberate them. Unfortunately for them, though, the empire knew they were coming, and they were prepared. The Catholic League chose their field of battle and dug themselves in. They began, from their strong position, harassing the lines of supply, forcing King Gustav to meet them on the field of battle. Though he knew that it was a poor decision, he realized it was his best, really his only option. The two armies met at the Battle of Lutzen in 1632. The Protestant forces were once again victorious, but King Gustavus Adolphus Magnus was killed. The tide, once again, began to turn. Without King Gustav's leadership, the Protestant forces faltered. They continued southwest, but without the same level of success that they had had before. They won some battles. They didn't lose them all, but they didn't win enough. Beyond that, many of the German princes who had originally flocked to join the forces of Protestantism... When the war began to turn, they decided it was best that they return home and secure their lands. By 1635, those same German princes decided to sue for peace with the empire. They signed the Treaty of Prague, conceding the return of their lands and the rights of Protestants within them. They were even granted amnesty for allying with the King of Sweden against their rightful emperor. The Protestants in the south, though, were still living under imperial control, and things had grown even worse for them. The thing to remember, though, is that the Treaty of Prague was only signed between the German princes and the empire. You see, in their agreement with France, by which France agreed to fund the war, any retreat or treaty signed with the Holy Roman Empire had to be approved by the French king. And neither the Swedish, the Scottish, or the French were about to let Ferdinand II have his way. The Swedish and Scottish pulled back and reorganized their forces. They split into two major armies, largely split down national lines. The Swedes were commanded by one of the top generals they had left, and the Scots commanded by the ranking Scottish general there on the continent. Their plan was to attack along parallel lines and flank any army that challenged them. At the very least, they would force the empire to split their own forces. And then, at long last, France mobilized. Not only France mobilized, though. 
England finally invested soldiers in the war, as did the Netherlands and the Germans of the Palatinate. In the west of Germany and the Spanish Netherlands, all along the Rhine, the combined forces of Protestantism moved on the Spanish Empire. At the end of last week's episode, I compared that opening move in the conflict, the Bohemian Revolt, to the opening moves of World War I. I've been struggling this entire episode to avoid making more parallels, some of which seem obvious but aren't exactly accurate, but now I can't avoid it any longer. France, along with her allies, including the English, are now fighting on the western front of Germany. Now, in the east, it's not the Russians, it's more the Swedes to the north, but Germany's forces are still forced to divide themselves, focus in two directions. They're being enclosed. It's the, in essence, same tactic used in World War I and in World War II. These armies could no longer move to support each other. They were very much occupied. Beyond that, there were other theaters of war. African colonies were constantly being fought over. Control of the spice trade and of the Asian colonies was almost as important as the war in Europe. India, China, the Ottoman Empire, they were all in play. I had to fight the urge to subtitle this episode something along the lines of World War Zero. And yes, of course, the New World was in play as well. Habsburg control of the New World was being threatened in a serious way. The English, the Dutch, the French, and yes, even the Danish and the Swedes were claiming islands as fast as their ships could sail. Wherever Spain was weak in the world, they were being pushed back, but especially in the New World. Hispaniola was, around this time, under siege by French buccaneers, and eventually they would push the capital of the Spanish colony there to the southeast, to Santo Domingo, and they would take over the coastline, including the island of Tortuga. The English, during this conflict, had sent their ships out to Old Providence Island to try and build a colony in the heart of the Spanish Caribbean. We know this story. All of that story, all of the roots of Caribbean piracy, have their roots in the Thirty Years' War. The intervention of the French in the war marked the turning point. There were many more battles and dates and places to name, but... It was clear at this point that the war in Europe would not end with the victory of the House of Habsburg and the snuffing out of Protestantism. It just wasn't going to happen. There were victories and defeats on both sides. There were great acts of heroism and lowly acts of cowardice. There were reversals, turns of fate. There were rising and falling fortunes. And for Ferdinand died and was replaced. King Philip died and was replaced. The Stuarts were deposed and then restored. Cardinal Richelieu died. King Louis died and he was replaced. It should be noted that he was replaced by Louis XIV, who was one of the most powerful and influential monarchs of all time, certainly the most powerful monarch during the Golden Age of Piracy. In the end, though, Europe had had enough of war. While Powerful monarchs vied for power against one another. It was the people that suffered. Cities that had stood for centuries were now gone. Fields had had crops either not be sown or left to rot instead of being harvested. The plague was everywhere. With the men away on campaign, women and children were forced to defend themselves against roving bands of hostile soldiers looking for food and plunder. This was real war, and it was terrible. When I think about this war, I think about Game of Thrones, as I often do. Near the end of the War of the Five Kings, the Riverlands is, well, it's essentially a wasteland. If you remember the scene where Arya and the Hound happen upon a farmer who has been stabbed and is waiting to die but unwilling to do so, he's the man I picture when I think about the people left behind during this war. You can see this disparity between the powerful and the powerless in the art of the time. Paintings, well, the paintings are all masterworks. They all depict great men doing great deeds, leading armies into power, or with all of their symbols of their wealth and influence around them. But paint was expensive, and paintings were a rich man's game. Woodcuts, on the other hand, were something that 
talented artists who didn't have the expensive materials could still produce and the woodcuts of the time are heartbreaking. They depict mass hangings and witch hunts. They have beggars, people dying from disease and starvation. They depict the abuse of women and children. In short, the woodcuts depict the terror of being alive during this time. There is a reason that Europe would not see another conflict on this scale until Napoleon. So, in the end, Europe and all its nations signed the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. This decentralized the power in the Holy Roman Empire, and it protected the religious freedom of the people. The treaty ended the Eighty Years' War as well, and it guaranteed the existence of the Dutch Republic, along with a number of other nation-states that were part of the Holy Roman Empire before, but now were completely independent. It really helped guarantee the balance of power in Europe. Now, it was at times walking on a knife's edge, but for about 160 years, they managed not to fall off completely. This was also, historians love to tell us, the last major religious war fought in Europe. But it wasn't, as we'll see in the weeks and months to come, the last religious war fought in the world. The Thirty Years' War, though, perhaps most importantly, signaled the decline of the Habsburgs, most notably in Spain. What was the largest and most powerful empire of the world was beginning to crumble around their monarchs' heads, making room for men like Henry Morgan and Francois Lolonnais to cut themselves a piece, and later on setting the stage for another conflict that would see men like Benjamin Hornigold and Edward Teach and Bartholomew Roberts brought to the New World. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank also our ship's quartermaster, Garrett, and our ship's master carpenter, Daniel, from over at Patreon, along with all of the other members of the crew. With our Patreon rewards beginning to trickle in, we're going to be getting those sent out, and I have restructured our reward system at Patreon. However, as a reward to everybody who's been so kind as to support the show when I had no rewards to give, we're going to give everybody over there a copy of our map and one of our super cool and very stylish buttons. If you're already a supporter, you're going to be getting those shortly, and if you'd like to get them at a lower pledge level, the cutoff date for that will be January 15th. I'd like to thank our sister crew over at the History of Westeros podcast for giving me the idea to give our crew members names, as well as Reddit user Edsel Hans for the very kind words you said about the show, and really everybody out there who has shared a mention of us or left a rating or review. This show relies on all of you guys doing that, and I appreciate it all deeply. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you're enjoying the music, why not go on over and check them out at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com or check us out on Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Once again, as always, most importantly, thank you for listening.